So last time I gave a reading of the creation accounts that are in Genesis 1 to 3. These are two very different stories, but their placement side by side suggests the possibility of a joint reading. Uh, nevertheless, they are very different in character, and today I want to focus in on the second creation story. This is the story that is predominantly in Genesis 2 and trickles into Genesis 3, um, and I'm going to look at it mostly in isolation from the first account. I'm going to be looking at it in light of an important parallel. This parallel is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh, and I'll be drawing on the work of many scholars, Nahum Sarna probably most uh, prominently among them, but others also who have devoted themselves to the study of these textual parallels and developing an interpretation of these stories. Now the Epic of Gilgamesh is a magnificent Mesopotamian epic that relates the exploits of a Sumerian king. King Gilgamesh of Uruk, that's the name of the city-state over which he is king. And the epic as we now have it was probably composed between 2000 and 1800 BCE. Um, Gilgamesh was apparently a historical character, an actual king of Uruk, but the story of course has fantastic and legendary qualities to it. Um, we have a full text of the epic that was located in the library of Ashurbanipal, um, a, an Assyrian king, it's a 7th century um, copy of the story, but we have fragments that are much, much older, that date back to the 18th century, that were found in Iraq. So clearly it's an old story, and we have even older um, prototypes for elements of the story as well. The story opens with the description of Gilgamesh. He's an extremely unpopular king. He's tyrannical, he's rapacious, he's undisciplined, he's oversexed. The people in the city cry out to the gods, they want relief from him, they particularly cite his abuses towards the young women of the city. And the god Aruru is told that she must deal with Gilgamesh. So Aruru fashions this noble savage named Enkidu. Enkidu is designed to be a match for Gilgamesh, and he's very much like the biblical human in Genesis 2. He's sort of an innocent, um, primitive, he appears unclothed, he lives a free, peaceful life in harmony with the animals, with nature and the beasts. He races across the steppes with the gazelles. But before he can enter the city and meet Gilgamesh, he has to be tamed. So a woman is sent to Enkidu, and her job is to provide the sexual initiation that will tame and civilize Enkidu. I'm reading now from the Epic of Gilgamesh. For six days and seven nights, Enkidu comes forth mating with the lass. After he had had his fill of her charms, he set his face toward his wild beasts. On seeing him, Enkidu, the gazelles ran off. The wild beasts of the steppe drew away from his body. Startled was Enkidu as his body became taut, his knees were motionless, for the wild beasts had gone. Enkidu had to slacken his pace, it was not as before, but he now had wisdom broader understanding. Returning, he sits at the feet of the harlot. I'm not sure why that translation. I've been told by those who know Akkadian that the word could mean harlot, prostitute. It could mean some sacred prostitute. I'm not an expert in Akkadian. But he looks up at the face of the harlot, his ears attentive as the harlot speaks. And the harlot says to him, to Enkidu, thou art wise, Enkidu, you art become like a god. Why with the wild creatures dost thou roam over the steppe? Come, let me lead thee to ramparted Uruk, to the holy temple, abode of Anu and Ishtar, where lives Gilgamesh, accomplished in strength, and like a wild ox lords it over the folk. As she speaks to him, her words find favor, his heart enlightened, he yearns for a friend. Enkidu says to her, to the harlot, up, lass, escort me to Gilgamesh. I will challenge him and will boldly address him. So that's tablet one from the Epic of Gilgamesh. So through this sexual experience, Enkidu has become wise, growing in mental and spiritual stature, and he is said to have become like a god. At the same time, there's been a concomitant loss of innocence. His harmonious unity with nature is broken. He clothes himself, and his old friends, the gazelles, run from him now. He will never again roam free with the animals. He cannot run as quickly. His pace slackens. He can't even keep up with them. So as one reads the epic, one senses this very deep ambivalence regarding the relative virtues and evils of civilized life and many of the features that make us human. On the one hand, it's clearly 
good that humans rise above the animals and build cities and wear clothes and pursue the arts of civilization and develop bonds of love and duty and friendship the way that animals do not. These are the things that make humans like the gods in the Epic of Gilgamesh. But on the other hand, these advances have also come at a cost. And in this story, there's also a sense of longing for the freedom of life in the wild, the innocent, simple, uncomplicated life lived day to day without plans, without toil, in harmony with nature, a somewhat Edenic existence. So there are very obvious parallels between this part of the epic that I've just read to you and our second creation story. Enkidu, like Adam, is fashioned from clay. He's a noble savage. He's a kind of innocent primitive, and he lives in a peaceful coexistence with animals. Nature yields its fruits to him without hard labor. He's unaware of, he's unattracted by the benefits of civilization, clothing, cities, and all their labor. Just as Enkidu gains wisdom and becomes like a god and loses his oneness with nature, so Adam and Eve, after eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, are said to have become like gods, and they also lose their harmonious relationship with nature. Um, in Genesis 3.15, God says to the snake, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. They shall strike at your head, and you shall strike at their heels. Presumably, there had been a peaceful relationship between creatures like snakes and humans to that point. They're banished now from the garden. It used to yield their fruits to them without any labor, but now humans have to toil for food, and the, the earth yields its fruits only um, stintingly. So in Genesis 3.18, God says to Adam, Cursed be the ground because of you. By toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it sprout for you, but your food shall be the grasses of the field. By the sweat of your brow shall you give bread to eat. So knowledge or wisdom or perhaps moral freedom seem to come at a very high price. But there are important differences between these stories, too. And the most important has to do with the nature of the act that leads to the transformation of the human characters. It's Enkidu's sexual experience, his seven-day encounter with the woman, that makes him wise and godlike at the cost of his life with the beasts. There has been uh, a long tradition of interpreting the um, deed or the sin of Adam and Eve, and Eve as sexual. And there are some hints in the story that would support such an interpretation. Adam and Eve eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in violation of God's command. Now, eating can perhaps be a metaphor for sex, some have argued. Knowledge of good and evil, perhaps that could be understood in sexual terms. In biblical Hebrew, the word to know can mean to know in the biblical sense. Um, it can mean sexual intercourse. Uh, snakes are symbols of renewed life and fertility in the East because they shed their skins, so they seem to be eternally young. Um, and they're also phallic symbols. Eve says that the snake seduced her and uses a term that has some sexual overtones. So do all of these hints suggest that in the biblical view, the change in Adam and Eve um, came about through sex. If so, is sex a negative thing forbidden by God? Well, it would depend if you view the change as a negative thing. That seems unlikely in my view. You will certainly hear it argued. God's first command to the first couple was to be fruitful and multiply. Now, admittedly, that comes from the first creation story in Genesis 1. Nevertheless, in the second creation story, when the writer is recounting the creation of woman, um, the writer refers to the fact that man and woman, woman will become one flesh. So it seems that sex was part of the plan for humans, even at creation. Also, it's only after their defiance of God's command that Adam and Eve first become aware of and ashamed by their nakedness putting the sort of sexual awakening after the act of disobedience rather than at the same time or, or prior to. So maybe what we have here is another polemic, another adaptation of familiar stories and motifs to express something new. Perhaps for the biblical writer, Adam and Eve's transformation occurs after an act of disobedience, not after a seven-day sexual encounter.